Hey everyone, welcome back to Static Pharmacology here on EMTV. I'll be giving you a patient care scenario, and your job is to develop a treatment plan that emphasizes pharmacological management. For an extra challenge, I'll be putting a one minute timer on the bottom of the screen. When this time is up, we'll do a scenario walkthrough and I'll give you my treatment. Enjoy the card and good luck. Three, two, one. Now here's a scenario I see all too often in the winter months. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at it. You are dispatched on a cold winter night to a private residence for a three-year-old patient with difficulty breathing. As you approach the patient, you hear a brassy cough that resembles a seal bark. Your patient is alert and tearful and clings to the parent as you try to examine them. The parent explains that their child awoke suddenly coughing and gasping for air. Physical examination reveals warm, dry skin and clear lung sounds throughout. Auscultation near the patient's trachea reveals a faint inspiratory strider. The parent denies any medical history except for a recent upper respiratory tract infection. Your partner obtains the following vital signs. Blood pressure 90 over 52, heart rate 144, respiratory rate 32, SpO2 99% on room air, temperature 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit, and an end tidal CO2 of 36. There is no rash present, the patient is not drooling, and you do not observe any retractions or accessory muscle use. Now the first time you encounter one of these patients, it can be a terrifying experience. And based on the information I've given you in the scenario, any seasoned provider or parent can tell you right away that this patient is suffering from croup. However, it is important to not remain complacent and to differentiate this from more significant medical events, such as epiglottitis. Croup is a condition brought about by subglottic edema. This edema is the result of inflammation caused by a recent upper respiratory tract infection and is usually gradual in onset. I know the scenario said that he suddenly woke up coughing and gasping for air, however it's very likely that this patient had a hoarse voice or cough earlier in the afternoon, but wasn't considered as significant as it is now. This subglottic edema puts pressure on the vocal folds, causing a brassy or seal bark cough, which is one of the trademark characteristics of croup. The inspiratory strider that can also be heard over the trachea is another indication that this patient is experiencing some sort of upper airway edema. But because the patient is not drooling, we know that this is less likely to be something like epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is considered more serious because the patient cannot handle their own secretions, and if it becomes bad enough, they'll need aggressive and early airway intervention. Croup, however, can be treated a little bit more subtly and is more about providing comfort measures to both the patient and the parents. Other signs and symptoms pointing away from a more significant airway event are the patient's mental status, they are alert and tearful, and clinging to the parent as you approach. This is a normal finding, and it's encouraging to see that the patient is consoled by the parent. Inconsolable patients usually point toward a more significant underlying pathology. The presence of tears speaks volumes to their fluid status. This patient is not dehydrated, and despite the slight increase in pulse and respiratory rate, these are fairly normal vital signs for a three-year-old. Now that we've looked at this patient in greater detail, let's go ahead and talk about the treatment.
Now just like with all my other cards, we'll begin treatment by regurgitating the mantra, Teen Safe BSI IVO2 Monitor. Or in this case, we could modify the mantra and actually exclude the IV. Pediatric patients with upper airway obstructions or potential obstructions generally do more poorly if you continue to agitate them. So if you don't need to place an IV for this patient, I wouldn't. The next thing we'll deliver is nebulized saline or ice or a combination. This is sometimes known as a cool mist or an ice neb. Although this treatment is controversial with some, it is considered soothing and has been shown to decrease the viscosity of mucus and may be causing some of the subglottic obstruction or edema. But if it is agitating the patient to do so, you can hold off on this. The next thing we'll deliver is nebulized racemic epinephrine. This is dosed at 0.25 to 0.5 milliliters with 2.5 to 3 mLs of saline added and nebulized over 15 minutes. Albuterol for these patients will not be effective because the issue here is subglottic edema. There is no bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction taking place, so the inhaled racemic epinephrine will actually begin to reduce some of the swelling in that subglottic region. The next medication we'll administer is dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticosteroid, and it's one of my favorite medications. It's dosed at 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, up to a total of 10 milligrams, and it can be given either IV, IM, or even PO. One of my favorite medications because you can take the same preparation out of the vial for IV administration and give it to the patient by mouth, saving the patient a needle stick. We could then consider administering ibuprofen or acetaminophen for discomfort. The ibuprofen dose is weight-based at 10 milligrams per kilogram, and the acetaminophen is also weight-based at 15 milligrams per kilogram. And then finally, if you have it, this may or may not improve the patient. It certainly won't make them worse. You could consider administering Heliox at a 70-30 mixture. This is 70% helium to 30% oxygen. Heliox is useful because helium, which is more buoyant than nitrogen, which makes up the vast majority of room air, is more able to flow through constricted airways, achieving what is referred to as laminar flow. Heliox is also used in some patients who are suffering from status asthmaticus as a last resort treatment. And because agitation can cause this patient to become worse, try to keep them as comfortable as possible and keep them with the parent. The interesting thing about croup though, is that oftentimes just by bringing them out of the house and exposing them to the cold environment, the symptoms will begin to resolve. So don't be surprised that when you take them out of their house on the way to your ambulance, you start to notice that they will actually improve. And then last but not least, rapid transport. And that's it. If you like this video, please make sure to head over to my channel for more. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe and check out my other playlists, Static Cardiology, as well as Paramedic Pathophys. Until I see you next time, stay safe and keep washing your hands.